Hello everyone, my name is Dave and I'm part of the team at Gold Hill and uh, today it's my pleasure to be carrying on in our series How Big Is Your God? And in this series we're thinking about different ways that we can actually make God smaller than he is. Ways that we can relate to him, ways that we can think about him, ways that we can treat him that actually make him less than the almighty, huge, majestic, all-powerful God that he is. So if you've uh, missed the series so far, we've thought about how big he is. We've thought about how big his love is and how big our love for him can be. We've, uh, and then last week, I kicked off the first of three uh, where we're looking at the first three commandments. And last, last week, we were looking at the first commandment, which is you shall have no other gods before me. Today, we're coming on to another commandment. And it's one that can actually end up in our thinking, often get lumped in with the first one. The first two uh, commandments, well, they're, they're just about idols. They're about having other gods. And then we move on to number three. But actually, commandment number two, I think, can often be really overlooked and neglected because it's saying something that's similar but different from commandment number one. And I think really important for us to look at today. So uh, let's get to it, shall we? Let's look at that second commandment that we find in Exodus chapter 20. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down and worship them. The first commandment was you shall have no other gods. The second commandment is, is a bit different. It's similar, but it's a bit different. It's saying don't make for yourself an image of God and then worship that. It's not saying don't have another God that's, that's completely separate from God. It's saying don't make yourself something as an image that you think will lead you to God, but actually ends up becoming your God. Don't build something and then start worshipping it. So what, what is this image idea all about? Well, uh, last week we used this visual image to, to depict us and all the stuff that we've got going on in our lives and, and the aim to have God at the top and above and bigger than all of it. That was the first commandment. The second commandment is also about us and God. But this second commandment is saying, go directly to God. Seek God yourself. Don't put something else in between you and God. There should be a direct line between you and God. And specifically, it's saying not to do this. It's saying not to create something, and there's a question mark, because we'll explore what some of those somethings could be. Something which is good, something which maybe is related to God, something which comes from God even. But then we start to focus on that. Maybe it was meant to lead us to God, and we think that's what's going to happen. But when we start to make that our end, when we start to make that the thing that we bow down and worship, then we find that all it will end up doing is actually pointing us back to ourselves. It will stop pointing us to God and it will start pointing us back to ourselves if we actually make that the main thing. It's a slightly different and slightly more complicated than the first commandment, but we're going to spend a bit of time thinking about it. One important thing to note here is that setting something else up that's designed to be an image that points us to God, something that sort of is a go-between, something that we look at and it draws us to God, it's well-intentioned. It's something that we do with good designs, with good aims, with a good heart. We think that this thing will draw us close. We can think, well, God seems very far off. God seems very far away. He seems hard to relate to. But this thing, I can get my head around this thing. And, and it promises to lead me to God. And so surely, looking to that thing, following that thing, well, surely it's good. Surely it's helpful. But actually what can end up happening is that it will take us away from God. I want to think about that this morning. But first, I want to finish reading the commandment. Because actually there are some sobering words that, that, that really plainly make it clear. God takes this seriously. Because the commandment doesn't just finish with, don't make for yourself an image in anything in the sky or the earth or the sea and don't bow down and worship it. The commandment carries on by saying, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. There are some hard words in there. There's a few things that I want to say as we, as we look at that and think, that doesn't sound like a God that is loving and kind. We, we can rub up against that word jealousy. I am a jealous God. Jealousy is not a bad thing in and of itself. Jealousy is a bad thing when it's misplaced. Jealousy that is about being paranoid, and about looking around every corner to see something that might take something away that belongs to you, that's bad, that's negative, that's a, 
That's a bad spirit to have. But jealousy of the kind that God is talking about, that says you're my people and I love you and I'm fiercely protective of you and I want nothing to come that will harm you. And so I will jealously protect you. I will try to make sure that anything that might take your attention or might take, your, take my place or th that might lead you astray, I'm gonna try very hard to stop you doing that. It's the jealous love that a parent might have for a child or a sp or spouses might have between themselves. It's not, it's not about paranoia. It's about being fiercely protective and loving. Also, I want to point out the difference in the length of time between God's judgment and his blessing and his favor. He says that it will be the third or fourth generation that will be judged for, for those who hate and for those who reject God, for those who do exactly what this commandment is saying we shouldn't do, but it will be to a thousand generations for those who love him and are faithful. God is far quicker to bless and to love than he is to judge. Also, can I just remind us what has just happened in the story at this point? God has just rescued his people from slavery. They've been slaves for hundreds of years in Egypt and God has rescued them. He's rescued them by doing amazing, almighty, miraculous things. He's then parted the Red Sea. He's then appeared to them in clouds of smoke and he's, he's revealed to them. He's given them uh, laws. He's spoken to them. He has come so close to them. So if the Israelites at this point were to turn around and to make an image because they thought God was too far away and they needed something to help them get close to him, it's a bit of a slap in the face to God. It's an insult. I have just come so close. I've appeared to, I've revealed myself to you, I've rescued you, I've saved you. And now you're saying, well, you seem too distant, so we need an image in place of you and we're going to bow down and worship that instead. I think God has every right in that situation to say, excuse me? Have you not been watching? Have you not been listening? I've come close to you. Now, if God chose to stay a long way away from us, if God chose to stay distant, if he chose to make himself inaccessible and hard to reach, then yeah, maybe we'd have a, maybe we'd have a leg to stand on. Maybe we'd have a reason to try and create something that would help us get closer to him. But friends, God has come close. God has come near. And in fact, this, th th this judgment that these verses speak of for those who do not follow this and the other commandments, we need to remember that all of that judgment and all of that blame and all of that guilt has been placed upon Jesus because in Jesus, God himself came close. He came close so that we could be near him. There is no need to set something else up as a go-between between, between us and God anymore. It never has been and there definitely isn't now. So what does it look like for us to follow this commandment today? Because the truth is that sometimes in our lives, for all kinds of different reasons, God can feel far off. So what is it? Who is it that we're meant to be focusing on? Who is it that we can draw close to? I want to think about that. I want to think about exactly who it is that our focus should be on. And then I'm going to think about some things that our focus can end up being on that maybe actually will be leading us in the wrong directions. So who should we focus on? I actually want to base some of my thoughts in a passage in the New Testament, uh, a passage from a letter that Paul wrote called Colossians. And we're just going to skip through a few verses in Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 15, because I think they answer this and they directly speak to this commandment. Paul starts by writing, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. What Paul is saying is that Jesus is the only actual true image of God. There are other things that might bear a resemblance. There are other things that, 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 that might carry some of him, but Jesus is the only one. Jesus is the only one who is the perfect image of the invisible God. The God that may seem far off, the God that seems distant that we can't see, has come close in Jesus. Jesus has shown us what God is like. What qualified Jesus to be that though? Well, Paul carries on. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. Christian belief is that the son of God, Jesus, is the one through whom the whole world was made. God spoke the world into being, but the word that he spoke was itself the Son of God. And everything has come about 
through him. And everything is held together by him. The Bible teaches us that the Son of God, that Jesus is the, is the power at the centre of the universe, holding all things together and keeping it in place. Every other power, every other authority is under him, exists for him. He and he alone is the one who we can say, if we are looking to Jesus, we are looking to God. He is not a go-between between between us and God. He is God. We can focus entirely with our lives upon Jesus. And if we do that, then we are looking to God. Then we are not setting up an image of our own and then worshipping it. No, we're not making something of our own and worshipping it. We're worshipping God. We're worshipping Jesus, sent from God, himself God. Then Paul carries on. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in him he might have the supremacy. Not only is Jesus, is the Son of God, head over the whole world, he's also head over the church. Come back to that in a little bit because, spoiler alert, church is one of the things that we can end up putting in that place that we think will lead us closer to God, but we focus so much on it that we can end up actually neglecting God. We'll come back to that in a moment, though. Paul carries on. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. This is the nub of it. This is maybe the central part of these verses. That all of God, the whole of God's fullness, is poured into Jesus. Anything else that we put in God's place makes our view of God smaller. That is not the case with Jesus, who is God. Anything else that we choose to focus on will end up being something that is lesser and smaller and not as significant as God. Not so with Jesus, because the whole fullness of God is poured into him. It's that great mystery of the faith that Jesus is fully human, fully like us, one of us in solidarity with us, but with all the fullness of God embodied there as well. If your God is the size of Jesus, you haven't made him smaller. How big is your God? If the answer to that question is he's as big as Jesus, then your answer is he is huge. If your answer is anything other than he's Jesus and he's as big as Jesus, then we might be falling short of the size that God is and can be. Paul carries on. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is what Jesus achieved for us. This is how he made it possible for us to come close to God. This is how he made it possible for there to be a way that was open. There's that word about reconciling, bringing us near, bringing bringing things that were previously estranged enemies and bringing them close. That is what Jesus has done for us. It is already done. It is finished. We can know that we are close with God because of what Jesus has done. We don't need a go-between. We have direct access to Jesus, direct access to God. Can, Can we just stop and pause for a moment and think about how amazing that is? That there is no barrier between us and God anymore, that we don't need a go between, we don't need some kind of intermediary or middle person. No, we can go directly to God. The the New Testament is full of that language. One of the last things Jesus says to his followers before he returns to heaven is, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He will always be with those who follow him. That's a promise of scripture. We're encouraged to boldly approach the throne of God. That may sound brazen, that may sound arrogant. How can I approach the throne of God, the King of heaven? But I'm told to do it boldly because Jesus has made the way for me to do that. There's another verse that talks about being able to come before God with unveiled faces that we can take our masks off. We don't have to put up a front. We don't have to put up something between us and God to make ourselves better. He's already put something between us and him in the form of Jesus, through whom we can come and access him. We don't need anything to come between us and God. We don't need anything to lead us to God. We have direct access already if we've received that reconciliation and that forgiveness that he's offered. That is what we have on on offer. But the second commandment is a reminder to us that we are really good 
at pretending we don't have that, at pretending that we need something else and setting something else up as a go-between that we end up focusing our attention on and worshipping. What might those things be? Well, I want to think about a few of them. The first, I kind of mentioned it already, is the church. Now, the church is good. And I'm talking about church buildings, church ministries, church activities, the whole lot. It's all wonderful, but it's not God. It can be so easy, particularly for those of us who have been Christians for a long time, to get so focused on church that we can end up neglecting God. I was talking to someone earlier uh, last year during, during this pandemic. They said, you know, actually with less church stuff going on, I've had more time to do God stuff. I pray that doesn't change. I pray that as we emerge from lockdown, that that person and others who I've had similar conversations with and heard things from, don't get so busy with church again, that they find themselves not having time for for God, for connecting with him, for spending time with him, for, for, for talking to other people about him, for spending time with the people that he's calling them to spend time with. The church can end up being something that we think will lead us to God, but we get so focused on the, the trappings and the goings on of church that we can miss out on God. Here's another one, a person. We can think that person leads me to God. I see so much of God in them. And and when I spend time with them, I'm, I'm drawn closer to God. If that's the case, brilliant. Spend time with that person if they are leading you to God. If though, you end up thinking they're so wonderful, they're so they're so fantastic, that actually we end up focusing on them, on them, on their gifts, on their skills, on what they can do. It's not actually leading us to God, it's leading us to focus more and more on that person. That's what Christian leaders can end up doing without meaning to. It's what people who do things like what I do can end up doing. I do not want people hanging on my every word if it's going to stop them from listening to God's word, listening to what God is saying to them. Preaching, great. Church leaders, fantastic. All of these things are good and have a place, but we need to make sure that they are leading us to God as the king of our lives rather than becoming the kings or queens in our lives. There's a story in the Old Testament, at a time when the people of God didn't have a king and all the other nations had a king. And the Israelites, the people of God, looked around at these other nations and they thought, we want to be like them. We don't feel impressive because we don't have a human king. And God said to them, but I'm your king. I'm your leader. Trust me. He said this through his servant, Samuel. And the people came back to Samuel and said, no, we want a king. And Samuel said to them, if you have a king, this is what your life will look like. And he listed all these different things that were negative things that would come as a result of having a human king, that they would be enslaved, that they would be treated poorly, that the king might not act justly. And the people said, no, but we want to look impressive. We want to have a king. And God said to Samuel, he said, "Okay, give them a king. But he also said to Samuel, it's not you they've rejected but they have rejected me as their king. Jesus is king of my life and no one else ever should be. By all means, read books, listen to podcasts, look to leaders who you respect, but ask that question, is this someone who leads me closer to Jesus or makes me more dependent upon themselves? Another thing that we might end up putting in that place of Jesus is our own experiences. You may have had amazing, wonderful, mountaintop experiences with God in your past. God is not only as good as your previous experience of him. Seek him today again for fresh bread and breakthrough, for fresh purpose and power. Don't live on the fumes of past encounters with God if you've had them. But I also want to say God isn't limited by the negative experiences you've had either of church, of life, God is far bigger than only the ways that you've known him or not known him, than you've seen him or not experienced him in the past. We can end up putting our own own experiences, which previously have led us to God, as being the most important thing. But what does that do? It ends up making us look back on ourselves. And finally, one more thing that I think we can sometimes put in the place of God, and this may sound controversial, but it's this, it's the Bible. Now, I wanna be clear, I love the Bible. I read the Bible, I study the Bible, I try to live what the Bible teaches me, 
But the Bible is not God. Into eternity, in heaven, as we spend eternity with God, it will not be an eternity of Bible study. It will be an eternity of being face to face with Jesus, of being up close and personal with God. The Bible is given to us graciously by God to draw us to him, to lead us to him. But sometimes it is possible to make the Bible an end in itself. If I know more, if I study more, if I read more, if I know my Bible better, then I will be a better Christian. I am not encouraging anyone to stop reading their Bible. I am encouraging us to make sure that we are reading it in order to bring us to God, not in order to be an end in itself, to become our focus instead of God. Jesus had some words to say about this. Jesus said to some of the religious leaders of his day, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. What I am not saying is that we should disregard the Bible. We absolutely should not. I stand on it as God's very word to us. Someone said to me recently that God's word is the very oxygen that they breathe. Absolutely. Amen to that. But let's not make knowing the Bible or studying the Bible or hearing the Bible or talking about the Bible as our goal. We need to be drawing to God. God who has the power. God who has given us the scriptures to draw us to himself. To help us to understand him and approach him well. That needs to be our focus and nothing else. So I hope what I'm saying is clear. I hope that that what you're hearing is not, wow, Dave hates the church and he hates leadership and he hates the Bible and he, he hates all of our experiences in our lives. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that if we limit God to the size of those things or our understanding of those things, then we might just have made God smaller than he wants to be and smaller than he is. With all of these things that God gives us, we should thank them for him and we should seek to keep them in their proper place, in the place that God has for them. We're actually going to be doing something now, something else that God has given to us. We're going to be sharing in communion together, bread and wine, in a, in, in, in a moment that Jesus himself instructed us to have, instructed us to carry out, to remember him to lead us back to him. This is not God. We don't worship bread and wine. We don't worship communion. But they are part of our worship that lead us to him. So in a moment, I'm going to have some bread and some wine. And I'd encourage you to to grab something that you can use as well if you haven't done already. And then in a moment, after a a brief pause, I'm going to give you a bit of time to, to reflect or to pause or to pray with just some of those words from the commandment up on the screen. Maybe thinking about what things we can end up putting, what we think is a go-between, something that will lead us to God, but actually has become too much of a focus for us. What is it that maybe we need to lay down? What are some of those things? And after a brief moment of pause, I'll come back and I'll lead us in that time of communion together. On the night that Jesus was betrayed by one of his friends, he took some bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup 
And he said, this is the new covenant or the new agreement, the new contract, the new promise in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. In the New Testament, we read that whenever we do this, we proclaim Jesus' death until he comes. This will lead us to Jesus. As we remember what he's done, as we receive it afresh, we come directly to him. You're not coming through me. You're not coming through anyone else. You're coming directly to him, using these as symbols and images. So let's take the bread and let's eat together as we come to Jesus in remembrance and thanksgiving. And let's take the wine or the juice, whatever it is that you have. The symbol isn't what's important. What's important is what it draws us to. As we come to Jesus, as we thank him, as we proclaim his death to ourselves, to those we're with in a room right now, to the heavenly realm, we thank Jesus, we remember him, and we come back to him again today. Let's drink together. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that we can come straight to you. We're sorry for the times when we put something else up with all the right intentions, with all the good intentions, thinking it will draw us to you and then we become focused on it. We're sorry for those times when we make you smaller than you are because we think we can't handle you or come close to you. Lord, thank you that you have come close to us. Thank you that in bread and wine we've remembered that and celebrated that. And Lord, we ask that as we, as we go, as we continue scattered in all the different places we are, that our focus would be on you. Not with other things more important or with other things in the way. Lord, help us to be about you and about your business. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.